Hello there, people of the internet. My name is Udur Jagero, and this is DWJ, or Dialogues with Jagero. Today, I am with Rex Poet, Nyangutino, my friend. You know, a lot of people have always misunderstood this man. We want to talk about his trauma. I want to also talk about my trauma. I want to talk about everybody's trauma. Today is that day. Mm. Nyangu, how are you doing? Happy. It's long, it's long since we since we sat on this podcast. You started your podcast called Underneath. So, so you are in direct competition with me. It's not direct competition. You are in <laughs> the space is big, right? Yes. I think the space is big. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 Lubanga was we like talk about the same thing. Lubanga, things. we don't. No. Hmm. I'm very specific to sex. You are a bit wider. I'm a bit wider. Stuff. What is what is it about, by the way? Nothing underneath. Nothing underneath. It's just do you wanna, do you, I want to give it a shout out. A dialogues with Jigiro. Nothing underneath is a podcast that shares the sex stories of everyday people, everyday people, right? Um, and so people just share what sex experiences they're having, their ideas around sex, their um, dreams, their desires, their fantasies, things they've gone through, things they've always wanted to do, all that stuff, mm. and it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. What are some of the things that you're hearing about sex? That well, uh, last time somebody told me about uh, a colleague of hers fucking her at work because she was bored. Another time it was a threesome and uh, somebody was fucking some someone with his friend. Um, today's story, uh, when we are recording this, the story that has gone up today is about a queer guy. Uh, is a is a man who was Kenyan and uh, realized that he's gay very early on in his life, and started experimenting when he was in secondary school with other boys. Mm. And you see, that's something he, he they had to do in secretion because if you found out in this country that those are things you're engaging in, then mm. the consequences are dire. So I mean, for me, that documentation is important because as a society, we are very nuanced about sex we pretend so much that this is not something we are ready to talk about or to do but we have a very scandalous relationship with the thing and i mean hence the podcast mm, nothing underneath you let us see the shit up from one so you are can it to kongankari onyango we know we have we have stories with our fathers about how we were raised uh a lot of people on the internet do not understand you so much. I wanted to talk about the the topic today is child trauma and trauma in general. I've spoken with Mick about uh, she'd call it church trauma, right? Religious trauma, church trauma, yes. Church trauma, yeah. She was talking about church trauma in a very in a very deep way, in a way that I've never heard before. Mm. How people in church, you know, get traumatized. Uh, I have told, always told this story over and over again about my childhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the things You reminded me, we said something about church in Kakumbuka ile mambo ya shorts na bakora. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. is that is crazy. Yeah, a lot of a lot of things have happened in my life. I think I've had a lot of trauma. And one of the one of the good things I've realized with um, one of the positives with this with this conversation that I have with people at Dallas with Jagero is just the fact that I am learning so much. Like it, I have learned so much in four months mm. than I have never learned before. Mm. Like there is a whole world out there yeah. that I, I didn't know about. Yeah. Like, like I, I was marveling at your wonder of uh, the story of the flood. Yes. Because many Christians often think. Oh, you watch that episode? Yes, <laughs> that only Christianity has that story. Yeah. Of the flood. But you see, there are so many stories in the Bible that are actually just recycled yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah they recycled stories but because this is the only document we have that uh, has those stories we think is the only place that these stories ever occurred so, mm. yeah. by the way how did you what did you think about that episode it was interesting yeah i mean um i loved what uh, she was talking about and uh, I, I i really think that we need to keep opening up Mm. space in culture and religion and spirituality to really understand that there is more than meets the eye. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, so that is what, uh, and I think I've told a lot of my stories about my childhood and uh, how it has affected me. Today, Mick was talking about our uh, trauma with money mm. and how we view money, how we view fear, how we view a lot of things. Uh, growing, growing up, 
you know, I've always, uh, my father is, uh, is a very interesting, you know, part of my life. Uh, and every time I look at my father and how he, he carried himself, uh, knowing what I know now, he, he didn't know about parenting. It is something that uh, he just and and Mick talked with me at length about how parents should actually in you know intentionally go for parenting classes mm. and know how children work and uh, how to protect children, mm. how to give them a life and how to send them out in the world with an open mind. Mm. So she was totally tell, talking about. Uh, I talked to her about what the church gave me and why, and I credit a lot to the church. And I also was telling her about the things that I think the church did not, did not, did not get right with me and my problems with the church, some of them up to now. Mm. See, and she was talking about how pastors claim to be pastors, but they really can't pastor because they don't have the knowledge to pastor. Because if you're pastoring somebody, it means that you know how humans work, mm. how they relate. But pastors think that the blood of Jesus, you know, does everything. <laughs> it's a job. <laughs> Which is not true. Yes. You know, growing up, I, what was, how did you grow up? Like, what do you remember about your childhood? I remember a lot. Mm. I, um, I'm the firstborn of three children. I'm a Luo. My dad is from Ugenya. Why is that important? Because it's part of my identity. Mm. Uh, my dad is from Ugenya. My mom is from South Nyanza. South Nyanza ni huko mfangano? Migori is a side. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, where the story, be, it's, it's the, where the, why it's important to mention how all this begins is because of what I'll mention later. Now, before me, my mom had another child who was her first child, but he passed on. Okay. She had just left high school, and uh, the allure of youth and zest, you know, got her to have sex with, with my dad, and they got a child, the child passed on. Then uh, I think in that space of healing from, I don't know if it was a miscarriage or she actually gave birth and the child died, but in that space of healing, I came through, okay, a year later, which is 88. And I survived. And so I think, I th sometimes I think it's my birth that sort of consummated this relationship. And now they were like, okay, let's, let's do this. But I hear stories that my mom's parents were not very happy with mom dating my father. I don't know how that went. Uh, what I remember is the first seven years of my life were very good. Very, very good. Mm. We stayed in Kitengela, and it was like a family. It's a very good community. Really stable friendships. Uh, sometimes my mom would leave me in another, like a neighbor's home, and we were safe, you know? We played Kalongolongo, we played uh, Police and Roba. Um, my dad, we were really good friends. He used to have this thing where he'd, he'd put me on um, the living room table and uh, put on uh, his Sanyo radio. For those who are old enough, who can remember Sanyo? And put on Lingala music or, or Sukus. And he'd tell me to dance for him. And so dancing became sort of like a love language in, in my home. Whenever I saw my father, I knew it's time to dance. you know. Uh, and we listened to a lot of music at home. He'd buy me Taifale on his papers, put me on his lap and tell me and show me how to read Swahili, you know. And in the evenings, we would take walks around the neighborhood as we visited his friends and life was good. We watched football together. And those years, we hadn't, uh, we didn't have the money to like afford color TV. So it was the black and white. And, you know, my dad would be like, he's, he's choosing the white team and I'm choosing the black team. And we are watching football made in Germany. That was Bundesliga those years. And it was really beautiful. For me, it wasn't. What, what wasn't beautiful? My, 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 
I didn't have that with my father. Oh yeah? At, at all, all at no, all? No, no, no. Never ever? No, my father was was very <laughs> <laughs> Ever, ever? No, my father. Oh, in fact, uh, my father was was always with his cousin, mm. who is a, who was a teacher mm. in my primary school. Mm. And those two gentlemen, they just used to drink mm. and have fun and beat their wives. Oh. That's yeah. all they did. Yeah, and look for money and dump the and dump food at the at the doorstep. So my father. Actually, his name is Omundo Tekoot. Eh. Omundo Mogo Tekoot. Eh. That is how he used to go by. That is the name he used to go by. So he believed that once he has provided unga, Everything that's it. Sorted, that's yeah. it. That's it. The woman look for for nini for a lot and uh, and and omena mm. and uh, you know sometimes he would bring it home. He also had a radio. Mm. Ours was uh, we used to we used to call it nation. Eh. So nation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was silver, yeah, silver yeah, black. Yeah, you know, I remember there was always an Oluenda, you know, <laughs> passing <laughs> by the green. Around. You know that that yes, ca, that yes, speaker yes, green. Yes, yes, yes. That's what that's what I remember about. Oluenda uh, is cockroach for those who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that is that is that is how my father, uh, and and he used to he used to like my. My sisters more than us, the boys, but I don't think it, the word is like. She respected them more than us, more than me and my brother. So were your, were your sisters older? Yes, I see. they were older, and they were a little bit respected, because for us we were like he didn't he didn't even want us to be next to him, like play next to him. Uh, you know, I remember very, very, very well that my father used to tell us to go under the table and and sit there. Yeah, do not be seen. Do not be seen. Mm. And I yeah. felt very unseen. It's crazy, man. You know, I felt very unseen with. Uh, so I played. I did all manner of things, but one thing that I did not do was to have that very close mm. relationship with my father. Mm. And I think even at the tail end of his life. Uh, he's a man that I that I never got to know. You know, there's a picture I took in Mombasa, and my sister saw it, and she has a, a photo of my father in Mombasa. Mm. You know, and we looked so alike. She told yeah. me that you guys looked so alike in that photo. And then and then I remember what what I told my mother, my sister, is that this. And then she sent me the the photo. Mm. And then I told her I would really like to know this man. Mm. This man mm. I don't know. Mm. Eh. Like you see, knowing somebody intimately, like what did he like apart from the booze? Yes, you know, I he? I could figure out that he liked the he liked booze and he liked he liked um, you know Kofi Olomide and all those other the, the music that he loved. But who was my father? I really, I really can't tell who he was, and that is why it was very interesting that if you were, if you were alive right now, those are stories that I would like to talk to him about, mm -hmm. you know. And and what were his fears? Mm -hmm. What are some of the things he really thought about parenthood? Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that he really thought about us, mm -hmm. about my mother? Because there was no love between the two. Mm -hmm. It is it was so obvious that these are people that that. That my mother was just in a marriage. Uh, she was just there to take care of my, of, of us. You you didn't see the love that uh, a, a woman would love for, would have for a man. They are, they tell us a story about uh, my mother coming home the very first time that she came to our place to marry my father. That she was in a in red slippers, mm. you know. Mm. And there is also a joke that. Uh, uh, let me look at that joke. <laughs> it's a very funny joke, <laughs> you know. Mm. So uh, that was the, that was the household, and I mean, it is interesting that yours was uh, <laughs> yours would become chaotic later. later. Oh man, the tables <laughs> turned really quickly. Yes, you know, for yeah, for I mean, at least for me, I do have those memories of uh, having a father I could relate with. You know, I knew the man loved football. I knew the man loved women. And he drank a lot as well. And he was also deeply in the church at the same time. Mm. 
So like on Saturdays he'd come home, amebebwa na marafiki wake. On Sunday tunaenda kanisa and he's reading announcements. He was like we were Catholics at home. He's reading announcements pale baada ya misa this this and that and so it was very confusing for me actually. But then I think the fact that we were a little closer blinded me from asking too many questions about who this guy was. He was also a gymnast. He loved gymnastics so much. Just going about in the air and whatever. So I borrowed or inherited a lot of my uh, athleticism from actually both my parents because they were both uh, sporty people. But then we moved from Kitengela and that's when the hell began because he was teaching in a government school and then we went to, for the first time he got work in a private school mm. and uh, you see that came with the money and then it also came with women mm. and then now the violence began so i could remember in some times uh, we were not living with my mother i was around 9 years old my mother is not at home she's gone to shags nobody is explaining to you what's really going on yeah. i'm living with the family friends my my dad is living on his own maybe something is going on but nobody is explaining this to you um my mother comes back we in rongai that time then we moved to huruma estate now huruma in 1998 was quite some place the crime rates were extremely high and those years it used to be called huruma slums i don't know if it's still the case now but uh, we lived in very dingy homes man you know nyumba yenye una umewasha stima the whole day because the window there's another plot on the other side you know there was no space at all ploti ukitoka nje majama wa busa wako hapo wanakunywa na wanapigana kupigana ile ya damu those men used to fight man yeah. I, <laughs> me, <laughs> i don't know <laughs> and it is in the same place that you boys are there with your friends playing bano playing football there is sewage going at yani there was chaos everywhere and at the same time my parents would fight a lot what were they fighting about at the time i couldn't tell yeah as a 9 10 year old you could not tell right uh but then now the incident that i would say changed me forever was what happened to me when i was 10 years old the context of the time i am told is my mother had sniffed dad was flirting with a neighbor at the flat and of course then it meant there is tension in the house so at the time my mother was uh, going through college which my dad was paying for and um, he was teaching at um, a fairly good school in Nairobi down home so this one day in 1998 he comes home we stayed in a single room that had a very small corridor for a kitchen and we stayed me my mom my dad my uncle who was my mom's brother and the house help so jamaa mkuja jioni and he starts looking for some book we had a lot of books in the house in fact that's one of the reasons i hated that house because there were academic books I I was not exposed to creative books that exposed me to things you know so I so home felt like another school and I didn't like it at all because my dad was obsessed with, with grades and all that stuff so he's looking for this book and he seems not to be finding it if something is not in the four corners of a single room surely it's not there yeah you get um I was used to being beaten I mean I was a fairly cheeky boy sometimes you steal five shillings here to go buy mutura go and, and uh, pay for some shillings you ride bicycles and stuff buy patko I, i i never used to steal like big money like 50 shillings was so much money for a 10 year old you know so yeah i had my cheekiness but then this night was different so after my dad could not trace this book he was looking for a bill cosby novel all right In 1998 Bill Cosby was huge the way you'd think of Trevor Noah today 
all right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we watched his comedy on tv he was huge he had borrowed this book from a student he tutored who lived at huruma flats and huruma flats at the time was like for the big people you know so the stakes were high and it seemed he had misplaced this text so kashetani kakamwambia aniulize ama ni wewe umechukua hii kitabu and i'm like dad no i have i have not seen that book i have seen it here for sure but i mean i remember it had a white cover but i have no business with a novel bodmas shule tayari na ni stress bana how what do i where am i taking a novel you are in what class i'm in class 6 okay but he is not convinced then he asks you this question which if an african parent asks you you have nowhere else to go si niwe pekee unaenda shule kwa hii nyumba mama yako anaweza iba kitabu what do you say you know can the house have still a book your uncle can he still a book you're your the one who was living there with you yes with the, we were staying there together mm. you're the only person going to school here <laughs> then he's like produce that book and it was interesting how suspicion moved to accusation yes it was like five minutes man you know so this guy starts beating me up but then this night was also different our mother used to and our mom, most of our mothers used to do this they used to hang their clothes with uh, this uh, copper wire for your your simu you know these telephone lines right the ones you see when you're traveling yeah. ones. yes our yes. mothers would take them and make them as hanging clothes to, to hang clothes hanging lines all right hanging line outside yes yangu yangu yes yes mm. so because we lived on the first floor of a flat that had a bar chini uh, the hanging lines were like you know here on the balcony up inje so kwa hii balcony there were some rolls of this these wires that uh, some of the mothers left there just in case wire katike or something so my father gets out he comes back to the house he comes back with the wire like a meter of that telephone copper wire and he strips me of my clothes okay and i was a really i had i mean if this is me at 35 can you imagine how i looked at 10 you looked like <laughs> shit i was a small thing <laughs> a tadpole you know so he starts beating me and he's like toa kitabu toa kitabu and my dad used to beat you with his soul my friend mm. all the anger that he carried in his body yeah. comes to this moment jamal alikuwa anapiga unajua so he is whipping my back and he's telling me to produce the book and i'm trying to cry out loud sina hiyo kitabu sijachukua hiyo kitabu and this goes on for a menacing 10 rigorous minutes and by the 12th 13th minute i can already feel my body disintegrating and mm. i'm like hey rix leo sasa tutafanyaje jesus kuzingine alikuwa ananipiga na mshipi anajaribu nini this night ah uh-uh, there was something else so i'm bleeding i'm crying i'm sweating my mother is looking my uncle can't do anything the house is there why can't why can't your uncle i cannot do understand what and my father was like it's like he went into a trance whenever he got angry it was those guys you know so you couldn't do anything to him plus this is a man whose house you're living in you're not paying rent there who are you to tell him what to do with his child you get what i mean so there's a power dynamic thing there so it reaches a point and i'm like today i have to lie actually mm. Yes I lie at other times but today I'm lying about something that I actually didn't do so that I can be left alone and I say at some point I say okay nilichukua I can't remember where I said I took it and then he looks at me with his bloodshot eyes and he says I'll do something to you that you will never forget mm. he walks out he comes back with a sisal rope as if he'd planned all this shit and he goes into the kitchen he comes back with the jerrican uh, paraffin jerrican eh yeah mafuta those days hiyo jerrican ilikuwa ina jana 70 shillings squeeze you ina jana mia ngapi and he he take he comes with the matchbox yeah 
and you know i'm on the floor i'm still <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. crying and, and all that and he ties my hand ties my hands he opens the paraffin jerry can pours some of the paraffin on the lid smears mm. the paraffin on my hand lights up the matchstick and puts the flame on my hand like this you know so i have a scar if, if you've been seeing it mm. yeah. so that's the scar this is the scar and i think my brain blocked mm. the pain of that specific moment because i couldn't i cannot remember it what i know is i felt like something had been broken inside me that i didn't have a name for you know i was never the same i could not walk for two weeks i remember my mom the next day trying to bandage me up everything i can't remember what i said happened at uh, at home when they asked me in school but then i began fearing the world because i imagined if these people at home mm. can do this to me what about strangers man mm. that's a 10 year old brain asking what about strangers you see so i withdrew completely became very quiet rick who was very outgoing and uh, you know play making and all that i just became quiet because now it's about protecting myself now you don't know what the next thing that is, that will happen mm. and at the same time mom and dad are still fighting a lot in the house and in a single room when people are fighting jagero but it's crazy because these people are bundling each other corner to corner to corner it's like wrestling you're just watching WWE there you know and sometimes you become collateral because sometimes i would try to get in between the fights to get my dad away from my mom and he'd just throw me out like like some fly you know so i did not know the the effects of what had happened that night life went back to normal like the previous night like nothing had happened Mm. And that's how things used to be in the home. They fight very badly tonight. Kesho nothing like maisha inaendelea. Mama anamka asubuhi, anapika chai, tunaamshwa, tunaenda shule, jioni unakuja unafanya homework, nothing had happened. Isn't that a horrible way of living? I, I remember that is the story that you're told you're telling is very close to what my older brother went through. Your older brother. Yeah. My uh, is it el- is the one the eldest? Yeah. Okay, well, the, one, the first the first the first the son yeah you know my father once accused him of stealing 200 shillings mm. and spending it with women <laughs> <laughs> how old was he why old was your brother then my brother was i think around uh, around 16 years old oh jeez okay yeah Listen. but then my father so my father used to come home drunk with money in his pocket and then would find a place to put it and then you'd forget mm. so i remember there is this time that uh, he lost 50 shillings mm. but he had put it uh, you know our our house in the village was was touched yes. you know so he just found a space uh, between the reeds akaweka yeah. tuapo mm. and then he, he beat my mother about it <laughs> yes and uh, i remember my, my my mother you got that money later on and spent it oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> she got that money back. But this yeah. one with the law they really fought. But my brother was uh oh that's a law. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but my brother was a bit a bit a bit uh difficult to deal with, eh? Yes. Him and my father they really hated each other. Yes. You know? Yeah. For obvious reasons, course, I think yeah. that my he just didn't like my father the way he was behaving, the way he was handling himself. So He didn't he didn't he didn't like him at all. So my father used to do that a lot. Uh, was you know putting money somewhere or drinking it or getting that he drank it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I remember an episode where my my father uh, almost you know my father was like his father. Mm. His father was worse mm. than him. Mm. A cruel 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 man. Mm. You know I remember that guy my grandfather you know He was drinking. He introduced his wife into drinking. Oh, your grandma now. My grandma no, but the other wife. Okay. The young the younger wife. Mm. He introduced her into drinking. Mm. 
and then she became a, a drunkard oh, more than more than him. Yes. Jeez. So she would really drink and not cook. Oh, okay. I remember there is a time this guy went and put knife on the jiko. Had it red, went and put it on my grandmother's thighs. What? I'm, t- <laughs> I'm, t- I'm telling you, she did it. He did it. What? He did it. What? This guy, this guy found his own son, Akiota Moto, you know, mm. with chicken bubbling. He mm. took his hand and put it in this chicken soup. He took the child's yes. hand. Why? Yes, my uncle. Why? Just because the guy was 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 taking a refuge next to the fire because it was so cold and he was supposed to be looking after animals. Oh. What? He did it. So he was my grandfather was a very violent man. You know? What I remember so vividly was this guy taking a whole rod. I don't know if you know kennels where where you keep the cattle mm. in the village they wanna funga yum lango with rods. Yes, yes. There is a way they do the roads yes, yes. all the way down. Yeah. A guy took one of the rods and landed it on a cow. The two horns went off. What? And that thing bled for hours. You know? So my father, my father, my father, he was not as cruel as his father. <laughs> 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 yeah. But he had his own really, yeah. really problem. I remember I was, because I in high school, I used to go to school on a, on a bike. Well, not a bike. Not picky picky. You see, mm-hmm. by scale. By scale. Black mamba. Black mamba. <laughs> <laughs> what? Black mamba. Yeah. So this guy, me, I don't, I don't remember this, the, 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 what pissed him off. Maybe he wanted me to go buy him medicine, cigarettes. By the way, he was also smoking. Mm. And he had a very bad idea about smoking. Mm. This guy, he would send me to the market, which is four kilometers away, <laughs> to go buy him one cigarette. <laughs> I come back. <laughs> he smokes all of it. After two hours, he wants to go to moja. That's madness. She <laughs> works. Uh-uh. <laughs> that is he would never send you for two. What? Yeah, it's a distance, bro. What? And Nyakachan is is dangerous. <laughs> so the guy would make you walk to what? the shops and buy him one, bring him change. He smokes it. Then two hours later, he tells you to go and get what? The, yeah. But I don't. Rem- this specific thing, I don't remember because his his father almost yeah. killed me. By the way, yeah. His own father. When he threw his jewel. Yes, mm. that Bakora. Mm. I was only saved by a village mate. So my father gets me. I was trying to fix the bike because Sunday was a, Monday was school. This is a Saturday. I'm trying to fix. I don't remember what he had told me to do that I hadn't done. So this guy, uh, you remember the batteries mm. for listening to radio? Waka power. Yes, this is a this is a kushikanisha. So see, I'm listening to some music I don't remember and working on the. The bike. On the bike. And you may wake up the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> no, the way they pinned white it, and then it sits on the saddle. Hey, you need to keep your man. So, my father was already bubbling with anger. <laughs> so, me, I turn. So, this is the thing. <laughs> this is the window. You see, I was on the window. I was between the windows. You see, Drisha and Afunguka Ivi. So, I was in between. The, the drisha. So, kuna moja hapa, kuna moja hapa. I am katikati hapa, mm. making the bike. The guy, maybe what the, what I had was a blast. The guy took that battery and threw it towards me. I don't know whether he didn't see the window. You kitu li chapa hii drisha, ikabomoa yote, ikakuja kwa hii, ikabomoa mpaka hiyo battery kaenda uko. You know, like, and you are the aim. Yes. And you know, I think the aftermath of it of it is just him looking at his window. <laughs> but then, uh, let's let's talk about uh, you know uh, childhood trauma. When somebody talks about childhood trauma, what comes to mind? And then we can go to definitions of childhood trauma. Well, I I often see myself a lot. Yeah. Because um, I I went through something in psychology is called complex post traumatic stress. Mm. 
which is uh, experiencing stress on different layers. Yeah. So on top of um, the w- witnessing violence between my parents, there was violence that was also being meted upon me. There was violence I was seeing in my neighborhood because especially in Huruma, I witnessed so many young people being gunned down by police, point blank, in the evenings. So you'd hear a gunshot at 6 p.m., man, you know? And some dude has just gone like that, and his meat is just all over the place. The trauma of poverty, all that chaos, growing up in... uh, Very (laughs) chaos. Man, the trauma, the, the trauma of poverty. It's bad. I mean, I mean, for me, I think that uh, I, I was telling somebody in a podcast the other day that I still have very active poverty trauma. Mm. You know, mm. especially I always tell people that I have never come to terms with this town, mm. with this city. Mm. Uh, every time I look at this city. I just I just see problems, you know. I was telling somebody the other day in this podcast that uh, there are parts of the city that when I go to, I I my blood just just go cold. Mm. I remember them very very clearly. Like Mudurwa, I don't like going there. Mm-hmm. Mudurwa just reminds me of utter powerlessness yes. and poverty. Yes, you know, when there is this, you know, when you are took. This university yes. down uh, the Polytechnic, yes. yes. There is a bridge that's going yes. over. Yeah, I anyways. don't like going to that bridge. <laughs> yes. That bridge reminds me of very dark, mm. dark times. Mm. There are the times of no food, there are the times of no school fees, no pocket money, despair, apathy, despair, sickness. It's just bad, bad, bad. So when you talk about when you talk about poverty and something that happens with poverty i think is that when it when mick was talking about reparenting yourself and i think i need to reparent myself again about poverty because if you grow up uh without anything you know my father was uh, my father obviously was an accountant but if you are if you are a friend of the bottle then whatever you do in life mm-hmm. whether you are whatever maybe if you are a billionaire or a millionaire but <laughs> you yeah. yes you Bro. just remain as a family no mm-hmm. nothing so you just grow up in luck every day luck every day luck every day luck every day luck you come to the city you are uh, and i think if you get into your adulthood with that luck yeah. it destroys you yeah. because you have embodied it you know it's in your body now Mm. You actually believe this is your identity. Yes, and sometimes even you can get a lot of money and it sits in the bank mm. and you're afraid of using it. Yeah. Or you squander it because you don't believe you know you 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 you're supposed to have money. Umezoea kuomba omba, umezoea kukosa, you just spend all of it so that you remain with what you know. I have seen I have seen friends who do that. Yes. But that when they get that. the money they just burn it in it's a matter of in a matter of days. Yeah. And they go back to the default, which yes. is ni pay fair, yeah, ni pay ni. Like that. Mm. So the extremes. So you go on the extremes. Either una, una become a hoarder or yeah. you, you become a spender. You are talking about definitions and types so, of childhood so yes. traumas. Yes. So I want to link that to a story, the mm. definition to a story. In 2015, uh, I mean, the fights had just gone overboard at home. I could no longer take it. And I was about... 25. So I, I called my parents to a meeting, which was a suicide mission, if I'm being honest. Mm. And uh, with my mother, it was easy. We can talk and tell her, you know, man, me, I don't think this marriage is healthy for you. I think you need to look for something else with your life. And at the time, uh, she had begun a family business, which was a school. And my father now had wanted to take over the school. And of course, my mother being a fighter, she was not going down quite easily. 
But then the man was already threatening to kill her. And even in the fights at home, he was strangling her. And you just never knew how far that would go. Because these men come home and they decide tonight is the night. And they just take you out. And they could take all of us out, you see. And I was like, mom, you know, this story mnonanga kwa news zenye majama wanakuja nyumbani wanafagia familia. This can easily be us. I don't think we need to die because of this business. Um, yes, he's really fucked up and we don't have control over it. But I think you can make a, a different decision to get out. So when it was my turn to talk to dad, he told me things that I, I think also even re-traumatized me. Because at the time, my mom was sick, really, really sick. And I remember him telling me, and I came there with a very gentle heart trying to talk to my dad. And I just remember feeling like I've really given up on that family completely. You know. But then as we were talking, this man asked me a question that also changed my life. <clears throat> he said, I don't come to you with my problems because you think I'm weak. You know? And that's a very powerful statement to come from any man. And that's that line sank into me like wine, my friend. This man who I've lived with for 25 years, first of all, what makes him think that I don't already know his weaknesses? Mm. You see, what is this idea of him? showing up as a perfect parent and he's already making the mistakes and we are suffering from them. Is this denial or what's going on around here? And it's the first time that I recognize this man is also not okay. There's something else going on. And I stop looking at him barely as my dad and start seeing him as another wounded child, just as I was wounded, you know? And my quest changes because now I stop centering him in my life because always it was about, oh, dad, we need you to change. We need you to do that, blah, blah, blah. And I realized it's not going to happen any soon. I need to find other ways to understand what this life is all about. So something like this is 2015. So 2017, I fall to depression, which was the second time that I was falling into depression after it happened when I was 16 years old. The story we didn't share at 16 is uh, <clears throat> what happened at, when I was 10 caught up with me. By the time I was 15, I started experiencing depression in high school. And uh, eventually I was expelled from school. Uh, had all these withdrawal symptoms. I don't want to read. I, I didn't wash my clothes. I'd steal people's clothes, steal people's money. My life was just in despair. At 16 years old, now I was running away from home. I became a street boy at some point. I was hanging out on Kenangi streets here with sex workers. I was shoplifting from supermarkets. And sometimes even there was a time I was caught and mob justice happened. I survived that. I became suicidal. I ran away all the way to Malindi. And uh, somehow there was a family that took me in there miraculously. But all these were symptoms of what's going on at home and nobody was picking this up. So you're being seen as a problematic adolescent. But really, these are symptoms of trauma that you, you are exhibiting in your behavior and your brain is actually suffering, but nobody seems to understand the language of this thing. So this, the second time I fell into depression and I was also suicidal, I was very public about it. 2017, early 2017. And that also really changed my life because being a storyteller, being an artist, you've known me all these years. Now I started pitching, uh, putting things together. And speaking up about it, there are so many people who reached out to me saying they were going through the same things. They were feeling depressive. They were feeling suicidal. And I was like, how come I don't hear about this thing in, in, in everyday life? Nobody's talking about it. Then I start questioning and it's my first time to go to therapy and I am being introduced to this word trauma <laughs> you know and mental health things 
And I'm like, how come I've never heard of this stuff all these years of my life? You know? So essentially, trauma is actually very wide. Uh, but at the very basic level, it is anything that happens to your body or your mind that, that destabilizes your normal body functioning. Okay? So even if I scratch your skin right now, your skin tissue goes through trauma because it has stabilized it has been destabilized you get what i mean so there is physical trauma there is psychological trauma that is why trauma. they they talk about a blunt trauma yes so yes because it has it is it has destabilized the normal functioning trauma comes from the greek word for wound okay so that's where um, medicine got the word trauma from it means wound all right so a wound definitely means there has been a destabilization of normal function because something has been opened up some wires have been cut or there is overexposure to danger right and so on very different levels there is either physical trauma there is either religious trauma or emotional trauma financial trauma um uh, sexual abuse trauma um child neglect all those things are forms of trauma okay so <clears throat> when i went to therapy um i was diagnosed with uh, anxiety depression and uh, post traumatic stress which they usually called ptsd and with 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 post traumatic stress really it's the long term effects the adverse effects of experiencing very difficult um situations when you you were where you felt helpless and you were exposed to danger and shock but did not have the proper support all right so even these nightmares that you talk about and dreams that and fear of going to certain places all those are forms of PTSD you know um that never got the support to heal you get what i mean so yes yeah, so that's in a nutshell what trauma means mm. and so so what 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 is what is the impact of that trauma on a child's you know yes. development now we cannot talk about that without understanding the brain okay the brain has many parts but for the purpose of the conversation i will speak about three major ones mm. so you have something called the hind brain the mid brain and the fore brain okay the hind brain is also sometimes called the reptilian brain it's the lowest part of the human brain usually the last part that uh, before you die is the last part that goes so you can find sometimes somebody is in a coma they're still alive but they are functioning their body is still functioning mm. that's the part of the brain that is um, responsible for your normal body functions your heart rate mm. um and then it it connects your nervous system to the brain as well where we call it's called the brain stem then the the mid brain is where we process our emotions yes. um and we store our memories it's also where we process sexual desire um and then you have the fore brain the fore brain is also called the the thinking brain or the frontal lobe so the frontal lobe usually it takes the most energy in your brain and in that part of the brain you use it to to solve problems to create right um to make decisions right uh, so what happens is when you are overexposed to trauma it means you are constantly on survival mode trying to protect yourself okay that means the part of your brain that is essential for your survival is overworking which is the reptilian brain okay it is overworking that means the other parts of the brain energy won't be going there for you to use all right so they are affected that means you can't process emotions properly and you can't think rationally you've heard stories of kikanyaga mtu town kidogo ana analipuka or you hear stories on the news somebody killed the other because of some 20 shilling debt or manchester united arsenal game eh hey, 
something like that mm. they can't think rationally they've been overexposed to to stress all right so your brain development is actually affected so you cannot sustain your life properly because the long term effects now becomes you do not know how to make friends you do not have any healthy coping mechanisms you struggle with relationships um you are into excesses or the extreme opposite mm. you get what i mean so children at that age when they are overly traumatized sometimes experience withdrawal symptoms or they get into drugs um or they are very they act out a lot at mm. home unaskia kijana ni msubufu msichana ni msubufu or whatever um and it happens a lot during this adolescent age this is when some of these things start manifesting but our culture takes it as this is just adolescence we often need to remember that when a child is developing especially when when they get to from 10 age of 10 to like around 16 17 those are very critical years the first 25 years of a human being's life are extremely ex- essential because this is the time their brains are developing their core values are developing their personalities are developing so going through traumatic experiences alters this process you know and that means they do not function as optimum human beings because your your body is overworking to keep you on survival so those are those are some of the effects of um, trauma in children mm. having having known uh, about child trauma what are some of the signs that uh, that parents probably should be able to look out for in in children i think the first point is for the parents themselves to look at in themselves first mm. because i think many of the times uh, we are living in a very complex uh, i have a longer story uh, answer for that we are living in a very complex uh, country mm. um this is a country that has had historical trauma that we don't talk about we have a lot of religious trauma that we don't talk about that we bring home to our kids we have a lot of uh, poverty trauma right that we are every day running away from <laughs> you know um we have a lot of gender trauma yeah uh who men are supposed to be women children all that stuff going on uh, queer people all that stuff going on there's a lot of trauma around identity so all these things are stuff we are going through at the same time you know Um so in most cases parents are first the ones who are traumatized before they can start looking out for trauma in their children they need to first look at themselves right uh and and that's one of the tenets of conscious parenting because many times we look at children as subjects in this country the same way uh the colonial white people looked at africans as subjects mm-hmm. right So if you are looking at your child and you're thinking this is somebody who is subject to me and not a full human being then chances are higher that you're going to abuse this person right and that's what happens a lot so in children many times when you feel the space at home is contracted and you cannot speak you cannot express yourself what children do is they shut down they withdraw they they look for attention in other ways yeah so you might find a child doing something so silly and it acts the parent so much and what the parent again does is to beat but what the child is saying in other ways is i need you to see me i need you to tell me to get out of under the under the under the under the mesa you know and your father would put you on top or sit you by sit by you and talk to you children want to be seen right um sometimes children will get into bad company so that they can get that sense of belonging that is not there at home 
or in their neighborhood or in their culture right um and sometimes they don't cooperate at all in school at home in the neighborhood unasikia tu akona ameingia kwa shida and all that stuff sometimes they also have a difficult time taking care of their hygiene okay so those are some of the uh, indications mm. and if you want to if you if you want to what are some of the approaches that somebody was been into childhood trauma can how do you begin to get out of it because like everybody that i speak with at this uh, this podcast is saying that there is a lot of that trauma how do you what is this the process of getting out of it so processes processes are many um i am really not of the idea that there is one way of dealing with trauma because you know even here you can be in one house we can we may have grown up in one house but the way i respond to trauma is different from way the way you will respond to trauma or even in this place right now a snake can appear but i might i might run away from the snake you might run towards the snake and festus might freeze right so we have very different responses to to what's going on in in the moment right that also means getting out of this thing in terms of healing also looks different from di- for different people so there are people who might need medical therapy because of how sometimes damaged the brain is there are people who might need just to talk about it which is talk therapy right or sometimes it's called cognitive behavioral therapy where you say what happens and somebody makes you make sense of what happened so that you can see ah so this is what it means okay then i can go a different way all right there is something else called somatic experiencing and this is what is mostly recommended for people who've gone through a lot of PTSD where your body is involved in the process of the healing so you take up exercises physical exercises you take up dancing you take up something called body mapping mm. you take up um uh hiking you take up activities that engage your body you know there's also something called exposure therapy mm. right where if let's say for me because even me my dad drank a lot mm. and uh, i remember back in the day i used to fear even seeing alcohol bottles it was a trigger you know i remember there was a time uh, i i had a gun is that because that is is that the reason why you don't drink hey, for me i don't drink be- maybe i don't drink because i i saw what alcohol did to my family and even it's just like extended family because i've lost people to alcoholism and for me it was like this this thing the chaos it has created in my whole life and in my home i don't need it right and you know yeah i do take wine and it's in very limited <laughs> amounts you've seen that mm. but yeah that's that's probably the reason so yes there are many processes uh to look into when trying to deal with trauma but also i must emphasize this the most sustainable tool is community community is the most sustainable tool for trauma healing because outside therapy outside all these other um interventions if you do not have community to share life with it becomes very difficult to heal in isolation you know and that's why the reason the therapy the, or the therapies are there and when i say therapies i'm not uh, necessarily saying sitting down to talk to a professional per se but including all these activities that i've mentioned the reason they exist is so that you can connect back with your body mm. and your nervous system so that you can be able to open up again and love and share and intimate with other people because our nervous system which is the parts that are also directly affected by trauma cannot connect when they are closed up mm. you know yeah. so you have to open up a little bit so that 
how does how does how does trauma affect us mostly in adulthood emotionally or even physically or uh, mentally there are so many ways um take a very simple example in the workplace if you, if if your boss was somebody who had a difficult childhood in the sense that they were violated and um they were not paid enough emotional attention they could be people who want to show how big they are you, you know you ever meet these people who always want to prove how big they are those guys those are that's a trauma response right that's in adulthood now it's showing like that or poverty and you get money and now you want to show people that you have money you know you get the big things and whatever that in a in an unsustainable way yeah you live lavishly in a way that you cannot sustain right others are violent to their partners yeah and their children yeah um <laughs> they are shouting all the time yeah which is different from what you do <laughs> um others don't communicate they don't know how to communicate their feelings why because when they were younger it was not they were never given space to express themselves so they don't know how to express their needs they don't know how to express their emotions another way is self sabotage that you don't believe you you can be in the places that you're in or the places that you get opportunities to get into right so sometimes because of what your brain was configured early on in your life to believe this is who you are you get into certain rooms you go to certain places and you don't believe you belong there because you're too small you believe you're too small that's another way some people don't know how to take care of themselves some people overshop some people overdrink some people over rely on drugs and substance substances to get by you know anything that gives them dopamine mm. so Yeah there are many many other forms in which um our traumas manifest in Then how do we trauma. cope with uh, with our trauma Again I I go back to community so when we are meeting up for FIFA the fight is in the pitch mm. you know I'm not coming to fight Jagero Yes right I'm coming to release pressure okay um to keep my he- my head level right I am getting off some steam from my body and that is a very important component of of coping right because connection is the best way to cope because you go back to yourself you come back to an equilibrium right and then of course there are the other activities that uh, we've mentioned where you get involved in other things that engage your mind and your body reading is also actually one of them yeah i remember even as a child when i had i had to start writing to cope because it was too much at home and i didn't have space to express myself so i started writing poetry and that's how it it all began those safe spaces that we can create for ourselves and each other are the most sustainable ways to cope way much beyond any kind of drugs we can take and for people who need medication by all means medication is essential to your survival even sometimes right but as a long term remedy as well we need people we need each other and that's why i often advocate for authenticity in individualism right where if i know i can be who i am and you let me be that we will have very limited space to traumatize each other you get what i mean if all the time you i i would shut you down when you are about to score a goal <laughs> i tell you ah keep quiet don't talk don't shout then you learn that oh i cannot be myself around this person yeah yeah then you shut down now imagine that happening to a child what does that do they actually believe that's all there is to life is to keep quiet right 
So activities that get us back to connection and in healthy ways for that matter, which is also an important part, um, are some of the things that we can use as coping mechanisms. Mm. Thank you, Nyango. It's always a pleasure talking to you about uh, about about the things. At least now people know about... Uh, are you are you gonna sit down with your father and uh, my father is dead there is no chance sometimes you, I, sometimes you, I consider father, mine dead you, too you, man yeah but he's not dead <laughs> oh, man, like <laughs> but he's not he's not he's not dead uh, if you have recognized that your father is uh, is just a sick you know you know some probably somebody did what uh, did what he did to you is something that somebody did to him mm. uh but I also feel like at this point, be, given the stories that you've told me off camera about your father, he, he doesn't want to get any help. He doesn't. He doesn't believe he has a problem. But that is that is that is interesting. That's and, where the issue is. But then, but then, but then again, some other people will also say that again it is not his problem, that he doesn't see the problem. That's okay, and that that's where my agency comes. I decide what I want to do with that truth. Yes. Yes. I decide whether I want to continue relating with him and stay being harmed. Yes. Or stay away. Because it is what it is. Mm. Of course, the problem is bigger than him. I know that. I'm very aware. I understand it. I just don't excuse it. Mm. Mm. I get it totally. And all that chaos with my mother. I get it. I've done all that work. I understand it. But you see, when we are coming to speak to each other, we have to lay our things bare. Our balls have to be on the table. Mm. And it's no longer about power dynamics. It's about truth. And mm. it goes very deep and we have to be humble. Because there now, you're sharing, I'm sharing. But if you come with the mind that you're higher than me, taller than me, and that what you say is what is right and what I'm saying means nothing, fam, nothing can happen there. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Mm. What there, there are people like your father. There are people like my father. Because you know, at the tail end of my at the tail end of my father's life, he was a he, it was a very it was very difficult to see what the man had become. Mm. You know, Jamal ekwa meisha kavisa. He lekwa meisha, but because the memories I have of my father in in the last last days of his life was a man standing by the window and looking out mm. for hours. <laughs> you know. He was he was really 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 depressed, and also the fact that he had lost his job, he had no friends or, or girl, the gentleman that they used to drink. <laughs> with. I don't know whether he had he had gone to AAR. Oh, AAR uh, insurance? Uko, no, AA AA double X. The alcohol in anonymous. anonymous. Yes, oh. he had gone there, mm. and he was now teaching people how oh. to how to quit alcohol. The cousin. Yeah. Oh my. So my father had, uh, had just, you know, he was just alone. Like when he retired and came back home, he had no friends. Yes. Literally. And I think also at some point he quit alcohol. Mm. But then he wasn't able to, you know, like for example, when I go to the village right now, I go visit homes. Yes. But I never saw that guy visiting homes. Yes. <laughs> he was always come and see Pombe Kwetu. Mm. I don't see him going to Kuwaiti. I don't see him going to come in Sunday or sitting with his sitting with his fucking brother. Mm. He's, he used to abuse his brother. Oh. When he's drunk. Mm. You know? Mm. But the funny thing, bro, is that I never saw my father like sit down his brothers mm. and just chat about life. Mm. I don't remember finding him at my at my uncle's places. And you know, you know, this is Omundo, mm. Aton, okay. And and this is this is this is this is one Sunday. Mm. They never talked. Mm. And the other one who was living on the other side, well is his father. Boro, I never saw well is his father coming to my to my father's compound. Mm. And talking to my father. Brothers. Yes. I never saw it. And Oya was living on the other side of the road, on the other side, next to next to the next to the next to the to the to the highway. I never saw the guy come down and talk to my father. My father never went those sides. 
you know and see these people are victims of their succ- the circumstances that, yeah. that that happened to them mm. you know it's just what it, it is you see and it's it's also really beyond us and that's why and this thing happens to a lot of men by the way it happens to a lot of men that in the latter years of their lives now there is nobody all these things they mess- there's a story i had use it to on the standard this guy when he was young he worked for Sujui Matiba Sujui who and he was going about drinking he had a lot of money and the women and everything and everything but bibi akamwacha na watoto wakaenda because they could not take it anymore the guy lost his job okay and he at some point worked at a bank wakapanga kuiba bank mhm wakapatikana kama kafungwa jela eh akitoka nje of course no nobody wants to associate with you you know he went to the streets aliokotwa na watu wa children's homes these for, are for for adult people in it was you you are to be sad eh yeah with the children that are working yes a whole mze dama eh aka sasa anaishi huko sasa these journalists huko kwa hiyo hiyo home ya the adult <laughs> sasa journalist alienda huko kusema story yake jamaa anaishi kwa home huko anasema sasa <laughs> anaongea na bibi yake <laughs> anaambia bibi <laughs> amekubali makosa <laughs> Anataka kurudi nyumbani. Ah, nyumbani. Nyumbani gani? Nyumbani gani? Nyumbani gani? Now he's advising young men. Muache pombe. Na yeye kutapata hapa na wanawake kila mali. Take care of your family. That's what he was saying. The man is sad and wrinkled. My friend, he has children. He grown ups nobody wants to associate with him mimi na unanga tu hapa twitter at these these young boys that they are threatening women who don't want them that these women will die single yeah. Yeah. on the ground wanaume ndo wana hii wana wanakufa na upweke my friend <laughs> wanakufa na upweke can i tell you my grandfather died as we finish my grandpa He had three wives, okay? And sasa in Luo culture if you're polygamous, yeah. you decide whether you want to jenga the boma all of them in one place or, or you separate them. them. Yeah. yeah. Grandpa decided everybody will be in one basket. Mm. Okay? So it was a humongous village. It was like a city. There were so many people there. But this man drank as well. In fact, my dad got it from him and he was chaotic. He was a soldier in the Second World War. Mm. Ole wa German. Eh. Na pi eh pia alirudi tu na PTSD. Hawakujua tu ni PTSD. Unaona? Cuz my mom would tell me stories about when the man would get into the bomber everybody just runs because he, <laughs> <laughs> he would hit even chicken. Akipata kwa njia anafagia. Huyo <laughs> jamaa. Maisha gani bali? Huyo jamaa litaseka. Unajua? Mm. Of course something is up in his brain. He doesn't know that, right? So when he was around 85 I think he's still drinking and the doctor and he had a strong body but the doctors are telling him bro hii pombe waacha bwana itakumaliza but he he could not live without it he was almost dependent on it you see so pale ushago unajua he had his own house katikati ya boma he would send his grandkids jioni with these opaque chupas unajua jioni kuna na mtoto anatembea na chupa unafikiria ameenda kununua maziwa ama mafuta ama mafuta yes hii ni pombe anamdanganya na 5 shillings alafu anampea pe, pesa ya pombe si mtoto analeta one day these uh, guys were just chilling in the boma jioni wanashanga eh, kuna karufu kanatoka kwa nyumba ya mzee mzee leo anapika nini jagero they went there they found the man sitting on a burning jiko your grandfather eh yeah. sitting on a burning jiko his nervous system was out drunk 
And he didn't stay for more than three weeks after that. He died. He went completely gone, gone, gone. You know? So these fathers of ours, there are so many things that ate them up. Okay? But I often feel, for example, we are also products of these men, aren't we? At some point, we were like, this is not the life I want. You know? You don't beat up Maya. Yeah. I've never seen even, you don't shout at her. Yeah. You don't beat up your wife. You're, you lived in that chaos. You saw it. You, you wake up at night sometimes because sometimes it's like you're relieving it. Yeah. Yeah? But you say, no, my hand. It won't for beating. No, no, no for beating. Mm. There are some things that for sure you've struggled with here and there as a result of that upbringing, for sure. Which some of them you know, some of them you still don't, right? Mm. Mm. But you decided, uh uh-uh, me, I want different. Yeah. And that's what separates us. Yeah. And that's why I do the work I do. Mm. Because I feel for many, many boys who didn't grow up with healthy models of men around them, it's really a pain in the ass to just exist on this earth because this earth demands a lot from you. I also, I also, th- I also think that uh, it's important to be aware of your surroundings and where you're coming from. Because, for example, <clears throat> some of the things I decided in my life that I don't want to do, first of all, is to, is to, is to beat the woman around me. Mm. You know? The other thing that I intentionally say is that I'm not going to get a lot of children. Because some of this anger is just coming from the fact that you can't feed me yeah, pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Daddy, daddy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, one is in in in, in Maranda Boys, another <laughs> one is you Kuala Girls, another one is you where yeah. deep in the Uyu Kaapa, yeah. and you've got other concubines, and you've got children outside there. <laughs> yeah, so chaos. you have a lot of problems going on. Take time. There is something that Bobby said here in this podcast. Bobby. Uh, you know, Roberta. Uh, Roberta. Roberta Bobby. Is that, I don't know whether it was Bobby or somebody else, that, uh-uh, it's not Bobby. It is, it is, uh, it is, it is, it is Gaiduma. Mm-hmm. Gaiduma said that she just realized that one day she just wakes up and realizes that, why am I doing all these things that I'm doing? Yeah. Why, why, why should I get married? You know, <laughs> why should I have children? Yeah. Why the hell am I going to school? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and she just took a breath and said, okay, number one, number two, number three, number four, me, I don't know. I, I, I didn't sit with anybody. I didn't sit any, down with anybody. And we agreed that I need to do these things, yeah. that I am going through life, this marriage thing, these children, this whatever, this whatever, how I wake up, how I, how I sleep. Mimi si kukubaliana na mtu. Nikifanya hizi vitu. I want to know who told me that I should be doing these things. Na tuongelejane, tujue why. Chanzo chake. Yes, why am I doing all these things? For what reason am I doing these things? So she started by dropping Christianity. She knew nani aliniambia. Mkana hiyo ni nieni. She stopped thinking about men and marriage. Yes. You know, the relationships are, mm. but marriage and having children, Mimi is you in Daniel, you know? So, I, in our lives today, we have got a lot of things that is expected of us. Ata Gaiduma is the one who told me, who is this society mm. Hey, mm. that has been giving us things to do? Mm. Ooh, I want to meet this who society. Is yes. Hey, yeah, this society Gani. When you go down to it, society is actually a, an illusion. Yes. Yeah, it's an illusion. Because I, I fear society. Hey. I want to impress society. Who is society? Who is society? Is it your neighbor? Is it the Makanga? When you are Kujui? When, uh, they don't know you. So... Mm. Yeah. You danced again on on, on today, the theater. I was dancing today. Me, I'm always dancing. Yeah, dancing is heaven. It's like sex. Young uh. <laughs> 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 All right, people of the internet, this is dialogues with Yagiro. That was long, eh? All right, people. <laughs> <laughs> Until another video vibe for now.